take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. And then for those of you who like to be ahead of things, we're going to uh, eventually go to 1 Timothy, chapter 3, same chapter we were in this morning. But to begin with, we want to go to Acts, chapter 6. In Acts, chapter 6. In verse 1, it says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to call you our Heavenly Father. And Lord, that is always important to us and no more than in the past than it is right now. But Lord, we just pray that you'll meet with us tonight, that you'll speak to our hearts, that you'll guide us in what we do. And Lord, help us to have an understanding as we take this important step in the future of our congregation. Now, Lord, move in our midst, we pray. Speak to us. Guide us into all truth by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We use terms like deacon and ordination often in churches. And if you went to, to different churches, you might find a little bit different slant on what those meanings are. Uh, for example, and I'm not, uh, not trying to pick on anybody, just going to give you an example. In a Roman Catholic church, the word deacon is going to be somewhat different than what it would be in our church. Uh, so you can find some differences there. But what do these words actually mean? They sound important. and. They sound important because they are important. But if we are to be a biblical church, we should not only know these terms, but we should follow the teaching of the word in important matters such as the ordination of deacons. So first of all, what is ordination? There are several Hebrew and Greek words that are translated into our English Bible as ordain or ordination or derivatives of that term. But all of these Hebrew and Greek words have similar meanings. They're not all identical, but they are all similar in their meanings. The Hebrew words carry the ideas of appointing someone or something to a particular service or function. Now, what do you mean someone or something? Well, when we built this building, uh, we began it in 1986, finished it in 1987, and then we had a dedication service for the building. And there's a plaque uh, by the door as you leave the, the main doors out there on the walls of about that dedication uh, that we had here. What did we do? We dedicated this building to the Lord's service. Now, this is building is a building. It is not the church. We a lot of times refer to it as the church building, but it really the church is you. You are the church, the congregation, the people. If we did not have a building and we still had all of us together, we would still be the church. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so uh, building or no building, we have a church. But this building was dedicated, and that's just an example of how we would dedicate things <clears throat> to the Lord's use. Then the Greek words for ordination have the uh, idea of appointing someone to a place or a position of authority. So the Hebrew words indicate that we are dedicating something or uh, sanctifying something, setting apart for the Lord's service. And the Greek words uh, have the idea of appointing someone to a place of position or authority. Three times in the New Testament, we see the phrase laying on of hands. And it appears to be related to ordination. And we'll show you some of that in, in just a little bit here. So for our consideration this time, we are going to think about the ordination of deacons. Now, like pastors, and we talked about pastors this morning, uh, deacons 
should be selected and then voted upon by the church itself. So that brings us to the next section, which is what is a deacon? Well, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul addresses his letter to the Philippians to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. The word deacon there means servant. It's exactly what it means. It means servant. Now, in every form of it that's used in the New Testament, it means servant. But this servant is in a particular office of service. Well, wait a minute. Can you be an officer and a servant at the same time? My friend, if you are an officer in any sense, you need to be a servant. Now, not all officers consider themselves to be servants, but all officers need to be servants. But the first deacons and the origin of this idea comes to us in Acts chapter 6 as we began to read a moment ago in verse 1. And we stop uh, at verse 4, but we plan to look down through verse 7. So Acts chapter 6 and verse 1 says, And in those days the number of the disciples was multiplied. They were growing daily. The end of Acts chapter 2 says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So people were being saved. People were being baptized. They were growing in the Lord. On that day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls are saved. It says that the Lord added to the church daily. And then Peter preaches again. And 5,000 come in, so 8,000 people on, in, on just two separate days, and then other people every day. The church was growing. Now, understand, this was the first church. We sometimes have churches in America today. That you'll see on the sign, it'll say, first church. And what does that mean? Well, you don't really know what that means, just if all you do is see the sign. What do you mean you don't know what it means to see the sign? Well... There are a lot of churches that call themselves first. I, I am really serious about that. But it may be the first Baptist church that was in that city or that location. It might be the first Presbyterian church that was in that city or location. It might be the first United Methodist church that was in that city or location. But if all you see on the sign is first church, you don't know what it is. Okay, first church of some sort. Okay. Maybe it was the first church to be built on that location. You don't really know. Uh, well, preacher, you know, these days we, uh, we're taking the denominational names off of churches because those denominational nation, national names can turn people away. I suppose they could. I don't know if you've ever noticed our, our sign out front. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to it. Uh, we didn't do this. The sign, whoever made that sign did this. We didn't ask for it to be done this way, uh, but it's, it's the way it is, the way it's been since the sign was installed. If you read that sign, if you were to look at it and read it out loud, it says, West Park Baptist Church. You know, have you noticed that? I mean, it is. West Park's like this, Baptist Church is like this. We didn't ask for it to be that way. We really didn't. That wasn't, wasn't our order, but that's the way it was done. So I guess it leaves a little question. I've been around. Uh, town some and maybe I'm talking to people and they say where is your church and I'm telling to try and tell them where we are and they'll say oh yeah that's the Baptist church over there they never say West Park they say that's the Baptist church and why because that's what you see on the sign why does that matter do you have to have that you do not have to have that you, it, it's not essential there's nowhere in the Bible says thou shalt have thy denominational name on your church sign nope nowhere does it say that but here's what it does do it gives people who don't know about the church, at least a ballpark idea of what kind of church you are. Does that matter? Well, to some people it doesn't. There was a point in my life when it wouldn't have mattered at all. Uh, when I, At the point that I was saved, I didn't know one church from another. So if you'd say, well, I go to a Baptist church or a Church of Christ, or, but I would say, well, that's nice, that's good. I, I wouldn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything at all. Matter of fact, I remember I was a new Christian and I was trying to witness to everybody I could. I was witnessing to a fellow at school. I did a lot of that. And um, he said, uh, well, I, I'd given some tracts to some fellows at school. And boy, here's the reaction I got. We were in an art class and we sat at a big table and we're sitting around and there was 
uh, several fellows around the table. And I came in one day in class and I gave them all tracts. And one fella, they all took them out and read them. And one fella took his, read it, didn't say a word, put it in his shirt pocket. I don't know what he thought about it. Uh, another fella took his and he started to read it and he says, Jesus Christ, what is this? Watered up and threw it in my face. Uh, another fella was reading it and he said, uh, hey, this is wrong. I said, it is? He said, yes. I said, what's wrong with it? He said, it's wrong because you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And I, not knowing anything, said, oh, no, brother, you got that wrong. You need to go ask your pastor about that. Let him straighten you out. I did not know that's what his pastor had taught him. I, I, I didn't know the difference in churches. Had no idea. So, and the other fellows had their reactions. Uh, one of them, one of them came to know the Lord after that, possibly two, but one for sure came to know the Lord after that. Which one? The guy who wadded the track up and threw it. He came to know the Lord later. But what, I, what I'm trying to get across to you is this. Having that denominal na denominational name out there uh, just gives people a ballpark idea. Now, you could go in there, and it could be a Baptist church, and some of you will not understand this, but those of us who are older will understand that Baptists are like Heinz soup. There's 57 varieties. Okay, so it, it just gives you a ballpark idea. If it says Presbyterian church, it could be, there are different kinds of Presbyterian churches. There are different kinds of Lutheran churches. There are different kinds of Methodist churches. So you don't know exactly what that church believes, but you, you have a general idea what to expect when you walk in. Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay. Um, but this church that we're talking about here in Acts 6 was the first church. What denomination was it? No, you don't understand. It was the first church. There were no other churches. There were no predecessor churches. This was it. This was the first church ever, and it was called the church at Jerusalem because that's what it was, the church at Jerusalem. They didn't have a sign. I'm pretty sure they didn't. Uh, they didn't have a sign, so it, if they had a sign, it could have said first church, and that one would have been accurate, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have a sign. Why? Because they didn't have a building of their own. Where'd they meet? They met at the temple. How do you know that? Because it says so right here in the book of Acts. So here we go. In those days, the number of the disciples was multiplied. The church is growing. And there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Grecians against the Hebrews. So there were Greek people who were angry with the Hebrew people. Yes, but you need to understand something. All of these people in this verse are Jewish. Well, no, no, it says Grecians and Hebrews. That's right. They're, the ones called Grecians were called Hellenistic Jews. What does that mean? It means they were Jewish by birth and by heritage, but they were Greek by culture. Well, why would that be? Well, for a long time prior to this point, uh, prior to the Romans taking over, I should say, the Greeks ruled that area. And Greek influence and Greek culture was still very prominent. Uh, one fellow who was not Jewish, uh, he was uh, king in Israel, was King Herod. And King Herod was Greek by culture. He was not Greek by birth. Uh, he may have had some Greek in his lineage. I wouldn't doubt that. It wouldn't be surprising. But, uh, but he was not Jewish. And he was not really Greek. But he was Greek by culture. And many of the people followed that. So that's the Grecians it's talking about here against the Hebrews who were strict followers of the Hebrew culture. So you had this mix of people in a church. And by the way, you should have a mix of people in a church. You should. If, if you don't, at least in America, if you don't, there's something odd there. And you may be in other places where uh, there is only one prevalent culture. But here in America, if you don't have a mix of cultures in your church, you somehow he's limited and uh, I, I don't think that's healthy but the Greek those who were Greek by culture felt that their widows were being neglected notice in the daily ministration what does that mean a lot of these people in the first church when they became Christians their families cut them off 
Sometimes their employers cut them off. Many times their friends cut them off and the people they associated with cut them off. And so who did they have? If they'd lost family or employers or friends or neighbors, who did they have? They had the church. And so there was a daily ministration among the church where they were serving food to people. Now, did everybody participate in receiving food? No. Uh, Folks who could provide for themselves did so. But those who couldn't provide for themselves, they were ministered to. And it says the widows were neglected. The Grecian widows or the Hellenistic widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So they're widows, and in that culture, widows generally, if once their husband was gone, did not have an income. There was no, uh, well, never mind. There was just no program for them to have an income. I started to use a term, but that'll get, get us off track, so I won't do it. But they didn't have an income, and so family would take care of them. Well, guess what? If you became a believer and your family cut you off, who's taking care of you then? Probably nobody. So the church would take care of these folks. And so in the daily administration, the Hellenistic Jewish widows were being neglected. So was that a legitimate concern? Yes, it was. There's no question about it. That was a legitimate concern. So because there was a legitimate concern, then something needed to be taken care of. And so that takes us to verse 2. Then the 12 called them all to the 12. Who? The 12. The 12 apostles. They were the pastors of this church. How many pastors did the church have? 12. How many members did the church have? Thousands. So they had 12 pastors. And the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them. So they called a congregational meeting and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now here's what they weren't doing. They weren't saying, look, fellas, got something to explain to you all. We are too good to serve tables. We're, that is beneath us. That is, that is, we're, we're just too good. For, that's not what they were saying. What they were saying is this. If we, this, here's a need in our congregation that, that has to be met. These folks are right. These widows are being neglected. We need to take care of them. But if we 12 take the time out to do that necessary function, it's going to take time away from our ministry of the word. And we feel and believe that ministering the word is our main job that we're called to do. So we need some help. That's what they were saying. Verse 3, wherefore, brethren, because of this, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. They, they felt seven men could handle it. And look at the specifications for these men. Not just uh, seven fellows, raise your hand, and, and we'll call, call on you. It wasn't like that. So look out among you. Look around the congregation here. Find seven men of honest report, good reputation, known for their honesty, full of the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Spirit of God. We said this morning, the fullness of the Spirit is to equip you to do what God has called you to do. That's, that's so evident all the way through the Bible. Seven men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. You know, there are a lot of good people, and I mean this sincerely. I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny here. A lot of good people who don't seem to have a lot of wisdom. Doesn't mean they're not good people. But these fellas, we need fellas, they said, who are honest, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that we may appoint them over this business. Notice the word appoint there. The word appoint there is synonymous to the word ordain. So we may appoint them over this business. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves, we, the apostles, who in this case were the pastors, will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Why? That was their main calling. And if they were going to minister the word properly, they needed time to pray. And so we'll give ourselves, we're going to focus on prayer and ministering the word. If you can give us seven men, we'll take care of this need that we have in the church. They were not too good to feed widows, but they needed to pray and study and teach and minister the word. Notice what happens next, verse 5. And the saying pleads the whole multitude. How'd they know that? Well, it doesn't say how they knew that. Uh, Maybe they said, all right, all in favor, raise your hand. 
and everybody raised their hand. Maybe that's how they did it. I don't know how they did it. Okay, it doesn't say how they did it, but somehow they knew that everybody there was unanimous in their favor of the subject. So the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose. Who chose? The multitude chose. The congregation chose. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And if you want to know more about Stephen, uh, read. we're going to stop at verse 7. You read verse 8 down to the end of this chapter and into verse 7, you'll read about this remarkable man, Stephen. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. What is a proselyte? It means he's uh, one who was brought into the faith. He came over and became Jewish by faith. He wasn't Jewish by birth, but he became Jewish by faith, and now he's become a Christian. And he was from Antioch, which tells us he was probably Syrian. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles. They brought him before the apostles. Whom, I'm sorry, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, they had an ordination of these seven men. They were appointed. The congregation was voted in favor of them. They laid hands on them and they prayed. And so they had an ordination for these seven men. What was the result of all that? Verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied. Now, wasn't that the goal? And what did the apostles say? We need to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what happened when they did it this way? The word of God increased. There was more ministry of the word. And the number of disciples, the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Isn't that amazing? Many of the priests in the temple became believers. God was doing wonderful things. And you know what? The Lord will do wonderful things when we do things according to his word and according to his will. He will. Leave Acts, if you will, now. I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7 to read about Stephen. But turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to take a look at verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Likewise. Likewise refers to verses 1 to 7 and the qualifications of being a pastor. We went through that this morning, so we're not going to this evening. But likewise, in like manner, uh, as the qualification for pastor, there are similar qualifications for the office of deacon. Notice back up in verse 1, it says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good works. So verse 8, likewise must the deacons be grave. What does that mean? Well, for a long time, a lot of people in America, I don't know about other countries, thought that meant a deacon could never smile. And it does not mean that. Okay, uh, if the deacon never smiles, maybe he's ill and you ought to pray for him. But, but the fact of the matter is, uh, that's not what this word means. What it does mean is they don't take this office lightly. It's not, a, oh, you need a deacon? Yeah, I'll be a deacon. No, no, this is a serious calling that they come to. So likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued. What does that mean? It means those who uh, are not gossiping, those who do not say one thing and do another, that's hypocrisy. Those who are not slanderers, uh, they don't do that. They need to be people who are honest in character and respectable in character. This is not given to much wine. Now, can I share something with you? Uh, this means here, that they, it, I've had somebody say, well, it says the pastor is not given to wine, but the deacon's not given to much wine, which means the pastor is not going to drink, but the deacon can drink a little bit. We had a fellow here many years ago. Most of you would not have known him. He went to be with the Lord many years ago, and um, he was nominated to be a deacon. But he came to me 
uh, one day before we uh, voted on him and, and he was not ordained to be deacon, and he said, uh, I, I know I was nominated, but I do not think I should be deacon. And I said, why not? And I, I had thought he should be a deacon. I really did. And uh, I still think he should have been, but you'll know why he wasn't in a moment. He says, so I want to resign the no or decline, you don't resign, decline the nomination. I said, why is that? He said, well, he says, I like a good cigar now and then, and I like to drink. And I don't think I should be a deacon. Now, I think he wanted me to say, well, that's okay, brother, you can still be deacon. But what he told me, what I understood him to be saying is, having my cigar and my drink is more important to me than being a deacon. And I am not willing to give that up in order to be a deacon. So we talked further and, and we came to mutual agreement that he would not go ahead and be a deacon. Well, preacher, you know what? If I came to you and, and said something, are you going to kick me out of church? I didn't kick him out of the church. Didn't. I want you to know that and I want you to understand that. What I'm saying is, though, these were priorities for him. And they meant more to him. If you came to me and you said, um, Pastor, you, you're going to stay here as pastor. You have to give up uh, playing any music. I like to play music. Don't do it very often. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's hard to remember the last time I did, but uh, I like to play music. If you said to me, you can't be pastor unless you give up playing music, and by the way, I don't think music is bad, I would stop playing music. Why? Because being pastor would mean more to me than playing music. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is the kind of thing that it's saying here when it says not double tongue, man of character, and then... It says, not given to much wine. He's not to be a drinker. Then he's not greedy of filthy lucre. He's not a man who's hard after money. Now look, the Bible nowhere says it's wrong for you to work hard and do well. It never says that. But what it is saying is don't be greedy. There's a difference. Verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. What does that mean? It means that they are holding the mystery of faith what is the mystery of faith? holding or keeping holding means keeping the mystery of the faith is the newly revealed truth of faith in the gospel well that's not new that's thousands of years old it was new when this was written and it was a new truth most of the world had not heard the gospel and the place where timothy was was preaching they had not heard the gospel so these deacons were keeping or guarding the mystery or the new truth of the faith in a pure conscience. Verse 10, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. What does that mean? Well, blameless here is the same thing it meant uh, back in verse 2 when it's talking about the pastor. So to be blameless, they have to be people of good character, and there should not be any occasion of accusation against them. Uh, and then it says they must be proved. In our church, a man cannot be nominated to be a deacon until he has been a member of the church for at least a year. He cannot be a deacon until he's been a member of the church for at least a year. Now, why is that? Because the Bible says we must first prove them. Now, do you ever look at that and say, well, let's see, this fellow became a member of the church on uh, July 12th. And uh, next July 12th, he's eligible. Yeah, you could do that. You could do that. Uh, it's, it's not that we're trying to be adamant and, and harsh about anything. It's we're trying to follow scripture and let the deacon first be proved. And then, watch very carefully, verse 10, and let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon. That is an office. Two offices in the local church, you find them both in this passage, 1 Timothy 3, the office of the pastor and the office of the deacon. Nowhere else do you find in the New Testament offices of a church. Okay, so office of pastor, office of a deacon. Now in our church, and by the way, this is not dictated by scripture, but in our church, the deacons also serve as the church board. 
And what does that mean? It means that they make decisions and they take action on different things. And some of them are, well, all of them to some degree, I, sh I shouldn't say some of them, all of them to some degree, but some of them more so than others are allowed to sign legal documents on behalf of the church. Okay, now, what do you mean there's different degrees? Well, not everybody here can sign a check. There are those who can, but not everybody can. But some of them could sign other things depending on the degree of the importance of it. And then, again, we already read that, be blameless. Now watch this, verse 11. Even so must their wives be. Oh, qualifications for the wife also? Yes. Even so must their wives be grave. What does that mean? Doesn't mean they can't smile. Doesn't mean they can't have a good time. Doesn't mean they can't enjoy and be pleasant. Doesn't mean any of that. It, it means they should take the thing serious and not be slanderers, uh, not speaking evil of others. They should be sober, uh, serious-minded about the business of the ministry, and faithful in all things. Then, just as it said about the pastor in verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. Same thing said about the pastor. is said about the deacon here. Finally, verse 13 says, for they that have used the office, there it is second time, of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So this is uh, the idea of a deacon. And to purchase to themselves a good degree means they have a good position in the Lord's work. And will probably be, if they're faithful, they'll be rewarded by the Lord for that work. And great boldness in the faith. Uh, to be servants of the Lord Jesus and his church, we need boldness. Where do we get boldness? It isn't from our own pride. It is from the power of the Holy Spirit. Read Acts chapter 4, verse 31, and you'll see that. It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. So, deacons are to be nominated by the church and elected by the church. I do not appoint deacons all by myself. I do not do that. The way we do it here is the current deacons nominate other deacons. Those nominations then go before the congregation, and the congregation votes on whether to accept these nominations. So who then chooses the deacons? The congregation. And then... The deacons are to be ordained by the church. And we're just about to do that here in a, a couple of minutes. And then the deacons who have been nominated and elected and ordained by the church, the deacons are to serve the congregation. That's their job. And they are to work towards the furtherance of the gospel and the spiritual growth of God's people. That's their job to serve the congregation, to work towards the furtherance of the gospel and the spiritual growth of God's people. So now at this time, we'll proceed to the ordination of deacons. So I'd like to have our current deacons come along with our, our two uh, deacon candidates. And gentlemen, if you just all come over on this side here, that'll be great. but that, that's the whole story by itself. Nothing bad happened, just things change. People move away, people pass away, things like that. So we have our two deacon candidates who were nominated, presented to the congregation, voted on by the congregation, and now we are going to ordain them to the office of deacon. And so we will do that, as the scripture says, by the laying on of hands. So. Gentlemen, I ask you two to come right here and just kneel if you would. Yeah, face the congregation. 
congregation, that's fine. And gentlemen, we're going to ask you to come in and uh, place your hands on each candidate. And then we're going to ask you each, as we did for the, the young ones this morning, go ahead and pray, okay? All right, let us all. Heavenly Father God, uh, we are so thankful that we're gathered here today and we're thankful for these two men. Father, we just pray that you would be with them and as they continue to work for you and to serve the church, Father, we pray that you would put a special blessing upon them and their families and that they would continue uh, to grow and that this, Father, that we would continue to do our work and do it well, Father, to preach out the, the gospel to let people know about Jesus who died on the cross, Father, and that we would be a help to Pastor and, and Brother Chris as well, and that the church would continue to grow, Father, that more people would come to know you and that you would just use us mightily, use these men, Father, that they would continue to be focused on you and, Father, to work hard in this year. We thank you so much for all that you do. We praise in Christ's name. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for these men that choose to serve you lord because that is the most important thing to serve the lord jesus christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day lord i respect both of these men and it's my honor to be here to represent that these men are going to serve you lord i pray that you will bless them lord i pray that you will speak to them i pray that you will show them what, what it is that is right in the sight of your eyes, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity for all of us here to serve you, Lord, because without you, we would be nothing. I thank you, Lord, and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and Father, as we continue in prayer, we thank you for Brother Cruz, for Brother Joe, uh, for their faithfulness and uh, being willing and wanting to step into the office of a deacon and father i pray that you would just uh, be a good work in their lives as they serve and as they minister and be a representative of our church here out in the community and to hear serving the people and, and i pray that as we uh, pray for them that you just fill them with your holy spirit help them to be guided by you help them to follow the things that you'd have them to do to help them to be example for us in the church and the congregation. Father, we pray that you just bless them and honor them, bless their wives as they serve alongside them. We ask these things here in Jesus' name. Lord, we continue and we thank you for Cruz Medina, for Joe Shalmo. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us of having them first as members of our congregation and then showing themselves faithful, showing themselves willing to serve, showing themselves leading in the various capacities. And Lord, having duly considered according to your word and following the consideration of the congregation and then seeking your spirit, it is our will and we believe it is your will to ordain these men to serve you in the office of a deacon. And Lord, bless them, use them, help us to work together, all of us, to follow your leadership and your guidance, where we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> just one thing, I forgot. Thank you so much. And uh, normally at this time we would have the invitation, but we're going to uh, press beyond that and just have the ending of the service. We want to thank you for being here. I believe it's been a good day in the house of the Lord. I hope you think the same thing. And um, we plan to go on from here. And thank God for you, all of you, and thank God for his leadership.